I wonder if he's gonna make a video about the Spezza signing. I made a video about the Mulgan signing. I kinda have to. Mulgan? So, this is pretty fun. The Toronto Maple Leafs re-signed Jason Spezza one year, $700,000. How dare you! The Toronto Maple Leafs re-signed Jason Spezza for one year, $700,000. There, uninterrupted this time. This less than 24 hours after saying on the podcast, yeah, you know, I don't think the Leafs are gonna bring back Jason Spezza. I don't know if he's an everyday player. But this signing and the way it happened makes me feel like the Leafs actually do. Well, yeah, obviously they want him stupid. They signed him. Well, you didn't say that about Malkin, did you? You said, who's that? I thought the Leafs might wait around on Jason Spezza. He might go to market. He might actually go to free agency, which he didn't this time. He didn't. They could have let it go to July 1st, or a a.k.a. October 9th, and he could have potentially gone anywhere. A few days pass, he's not everyone's first, second, or third option. Then you loop back around and go, hey, do you still want to play for us? No, the Leafs made it a priority to sign Jason Spezza over 24 hours ahead of the first round of the NHL entry draft. I'm not suggesting the Leafs are going to stop looking for good players, but they do feel like Jason Spezza is one. And why not? Why not? We all know the story with Jason Spezza from last season. We talked about a few different players. They never quite started on the right foot because of how Babcock used them. Tyson Berry was a big one. If you go back to last season, last preseason, all the way back to the first games there in Newfoundland, which now are over a calendar year ago, Mike Babcock never ever for one moment understood what he had with Jason Spezza. And it was just one player on a $700,000 deal, but it was just a microcosm, just it, just another example of how Babcock and Dubas, they just didn't gel. Spezza has a great preseason game and Babcock's like, yeah, well, you know, if he wants to make this team, he's got to kill penalties. And then he has Nick Shore play the home opener over Jason Spezza because, yeah, well, he's got to get his penalty killing up to snuff. He's not a penalty killer. Would you go off? Off-roading in your Mazda 3? No, that's not what it's for! He's a leader on your team, a depth scorer, a second power play option, he's got filthy hands for the shootout, and he's been around for a while. Now, considering the beginning to Jason Spezza's Leafs tenure, considering the fact that had it not been for an injury deep into the fall, that Jason Spezza might have got traded or put on waivers, he had a very good season with the Leafs last year. He had 9 goals and 16 assists for 25 points in 58 games in what was mostly a fourth line role, sometimes creeping into the third line when they really needed him. And yes, some of those points come from the second power play unit, but they didn't see a lot of ice time, did they? And some of the talk this offseason has been the Leafs got to find better bottom six options, better bottom six scoring. Well, 25 points in 58 games is a 35 point pace. That's pretty good for a bottom six option. Especially one that has over 1,100 regular season NHL games and 80 NHL playoff games. Stanley Cup playoff games. Nine of those 25 points were goals beating his goal totals from each of the past two seasons that he played with the Dallas Stars. And his pace last season was a better scoring pace than each of his last two seasons with the Dallas Stars. So he might be 37, but he's playing like he's 34, gosh darn it. Spezza has said more than once that the fire still burns, and it's obvious. As soon as the Leafs got eliminated by the Columbus Blue Jackets. He was working out, he was in Toronto, and he was talking to Kyle Dubas. Not to mention, the Leafs were about to get mopped by the Blue Jackets in four, and then infamously, down 3 nothing. Spezza starts a fight. Now, we're not going to talk about that like that was the complete momentum changer and it was heroic and that's what turned the tides of the game. We're going to ignore the fact that he also took a penalty that put the Leafs on the penalty kill. It was a solid 20 minutes of gameplay after that that they even got on the board. But it was the mere fact that he did it, that he was willing for crying out loud, that made me go, I want this guy to be a Leaf forever. And if you go back and look at my video series from just a few months ago, 70 in 7, where I went through all 70 regular season games from last season, there were so many games the Leafs did not show up at all. And Jason Spezza was one of the two or three guys who did. Case in point, remember Casimir Kaskiswo's first and only NHL game, that game against the Pittsburgh Penguins in Pittsburgh? Spezza scored in that game. That game at home where they blew a substantial lead against the Ducks. Spezza was there to get the Leafs back into the game by scoring on the rush, fake clapper on Ryan Miller, tucks it around him. Now the Leafs would go on to blow that too and need overtime to win the game and that's besides the point. People are lightning quick to trash Toronto like no one wants to play there because it's hard and they're mean. Spezza is now on his second $700,000 contract with the Leafs and if you think he couldn't have got that elsewhere or more elsewhere, you're kidding yourselves. He wants to be here. He wants to win here. You should want this guy on your team. Now, Let's be realistic about his limitations. A defensive specialist, he is not. A penalty killer, he is not. Mike! 
Where was I? A third liner? Maybe on the wing. And this is part of the reason why I wasn't totally sure he was coming back. He's got those beautiful playmaking hands, great offensive instincts, but as a third line center, eh. And then during that series against Columbus, he wasn't really playing center. It was it was actually Pierre Engvall who was not really a full-time NHL center before that at all. But one thing that I said heading into that series, and they never tried it, but oh, I would love to see it. Nick Robertson put up 50 goals plus in the OHL with ease because he had another Leaf prospect, Simeon Dur Argachinsev, just feeding him the puck, feeding him the puck. Beautiful playmaking ability. You don't throw Nicky to the Wolves by putting him in the top six right away. I don't think so. But in a bottom six role with a guy like Jason Spezza feeding him the puck, imagine what he could do. Will he be a healthy scratch a few times? He might be, but you need a lot of good players to win the Stanley Cup, more than just your opening night roster. I had also wondered if Jason Spezza was gonna ask for a raise after last season. He didn't. You signed that deal in a heartbeat. Awesome that he's a Leaf. Now, before we go, Kyle Dubas said some things ahead of the draft, which is tomorrow. Kyle Dubas on whether the Leafs will use the number 15 pick or trade it. It's really all sort of on the table right now. Well, thank you for that big bucket of nothing. They might trade it, they might not trade it. It's a boring answer. Good job! Boring is an upgrade for Kyle Dubas. I thought he was boring until Lou Lamorello left. First day on the job just grabs a microphone and stands in front of an audience like John Mulaney with glasses and declares we can and we will. And I don't know if you've heard that phrase before, but it's gotten some attention. Kyle Dubas says the Leafs consider it a priority to become a harder team to play against. Plans to address that with new personnel acquired via trade or free agency. Now, some of you are like, oh, you gotta stop equating hard nose with bad. It doesn't automatically mean good. There's been an overcorrection. This team's number one priority, number one priority is what? That's right, finding Morgan Riley the best defense partner he's ever played with because as of the current date, it's a toss up between Tyson Berry and Ron Hainsey. And for those of you yelling at the screen saying that's an insult to Ron Hainsey, I think you've put your finger on the problem because you know it makes it harder to play against. Good play! And I see some people pulling out their charts and, oh, here's why you shouldn't sign Radko Gouda. You listen. You listen here. I have no problem with the Leafs going out and getting a giant pair of fists with a beard. Okay? You want to have a giant pair of fists with a beard on your team, you just don't necessarily want it on your first pair. I am not asking Mitch Marner to learn Muay Thai and Austin Matthews Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I am merely asking that the other guys on the team, because those players are pretty good, to bash the other team around a little bit. Did you watch the playoffs? You shoulda. Whoever the Leafs get for their bottom six, I'm honestly not that fussed what their micro stats are. I don't know if you can afford to be that fussed when you scored 10 playoff goals and Matt Martin and Leo Komarov combined for six. With less ice time, might I add. What I think will make the Leafs forward group better, lines one through four, what'll make their whole roster better, and it'll make Freddy's job a lot easier, better defense. Harder to play against shift to shift because you might get beat up? Sure. Harder to play against because it's harder to score on you? Sure. I'll have a big helping of both of those things. So if he goes out and gets a couple tough guys, let's not bite Dubas' head off because he didn't go out and get prime Pavel Datsuk times two. At this point, I'm willing to settle for not objectively terrible and, uh, you know, maybe less than six years. Maybe I'll end on this one. Kyle Dubas on Frederick Anderson. As of this moment, yes, I expect him to be the starting goalie for our team. Hints that he's unhappy about where the trade speculation originated and has addressed it directly with Anderson. I don't pay any mind to that. It's just, it's Dubas sticking up for his guys, which he does, which is good. I don't think this trade speculation popped out of thin air. I think it popped out of logic. Frederick Anderson, now that his signing bonus has already been paid for this season by the Toronto Maple Leafs, has a base salary of one million dollars. Is he a top 10 starter in the league or at very least a top 15 starter? I'd say so. How do you get one of those for less than a million dollars or even a million on the button like Price is Right? You can't. It's incredible value which means the Leafs could get a lot for him in a trade. Here's the problem. Once you trade him you have to replace him. And then you gotta use some of the stuff that you use to get him to get a replacement. Some of you might suggest, okay, cool, just do that on account of he might walk in a year anyway. Yeah, you're right. Or, in the meantime, just keep Frederick Anderson, because while you have Frederick Anderson, you have Frederick Anderson. He's not a bad goalie, guys. At this point, if he's traded, I won't be brokenhearted as long as it makes sense. And if they keep him, great!
He's pretty good. And with that, who knows, something might happen before this video is even uploaded. But that is it for this one. Thank you very much for watching. Click like if you like this video. Click subscribe if you really liked it. Tell all your friends the draft's tomorrow night. Get together and, well, no, actually stay far apart and uh, watch it together on Zoom or Google Hangout or one of those things.